to discover the origins of the popular New Age positive thinking, crystal gazing spirituality of the time that we live in, we would have to take a winding route back through history, which many practitioners would not wish to explore. We would have to go back through such figures as the notorious and publicity-seeking Alistair Crowley, Israel Regarde, through such literary figures as W.B. Yeats, theatre producer Annie Horneman, and to such secret orders as the Ordo Templi Orientis and the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And we would have to wind our way back even further to the 18th century, where there was a an explosion of pseudo-Masonic rites and countless Masonic mystics such as Martinez, Pasquale, Count Cagliostro and Baron von Hund. I'm Angel Miller, I'm the author of The Three Stages of Initiatic Spirituality and The Path of the Warrior Mystic. Today I'm speaking with David Harrison, easily the best-known British historian of Freemasonry, uh, with books on the subject from The Genesis of Freemasonry, Rediscovered Rituals of English Freemasonry, and The Lost Rites and Rituals of Freemasonry, which we'll be discussing today. David, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, thank thank you. Thank you. So today we're going to speak about your book, The Lost Rites and Rituals of Freemasonry, uh, mm. which covers a lot of really curious uh, ground that uh, I think many Freemasons and certainly many non-Masons w- won't really know about, such as uh, the Baron von Hund and the Strict Observance, uh, mm. Willemotz, uh, the creator of the uh, Rose Croix degree, a uh, very spiritual and esoteric individual, and mm-hmm. uh, Count Cagliostro, of course, and yeah. um, and that sort of milieu that crosses over between Freemasonry and occultism. Mm. But uh, before we get on to that, maybe you could just give us a little bit about your background. How did you uh, become to be interested in Freemasonry and what interests you in it today? Yeah, well... Um... You, you mentioned yourself that you was um, you, you went to the States in 97 and that that was the year really that uh, I, I became aware of Freemasonry really I was mm. uh, seeing a girl um, I just finished university uh, I, I just left the band as well uh, I, I was in a band for a few years um, and um, that that split up so um, I was I was looking for a job really you know finish university you start looking around for a job and you're a bit bit directionless mm-hmm. um and uh the girl's father that I, I was seeing he was a freemason he was in a lodge in cheshire and we ended up going to uh one or two of the socials you know mm. um and at the time as well i was looking at doing an ma yeah and I had this interview at University of Liverpool and he says, well, what, what would you like to do the MA on? And I thought, oh, well, you know, the history of Freemasonry sounds, sounds interesting, you know, mm-hmm. it's yeah. a nice, nice ring to it. So they said, yeah, great, you know. Um, and at the same time, I, I, I got on well with, with uh, you know, my girlfriend's father at the time and he, and he basically suggested, well, why, why, why don't you join? Mm. And I says, well, you know, it might, might, might not be for me, you know. Um, because um, I wasn't at that stage a shirt and tie kind of guy, you know. I was, right. you know, um, jeans and t-shirt kind of going out and things, and and um, you know, I'd just come out of a band, and and, and I was thinking right. of still going back into a band at, at, at the time. So I, I was still in that social scene, mm. but I joined anyway, and um, yeah, yeah, I liked it at the time. You know, it was good. It was. Um, being a historian, you know, I could see all the historical aspects to it. You know, there was this context to it, right? This context to it, um, and uh, it was a, a country lodge that, that was meeting above a pub in in a village. Oh wow, in Cheshire. So just just as the old um, lodges used to meet, yeah, in the 18th century, you know, the early 19th century, before the, the Masonic halls were were built and became fashionable. 
Mm. Uh, so it was great, you know, and, and I could see this kind of old 18th century outlook with this particular lodge, you know, when we, yeah. when we first went into the room, we had to assemble all the furniture and get everything ready. And then when the meeting was over, we had to clear everything away and get a table out for the meal, you know. Oh, and, right. Uh, so it was very traditional. Yeah. And um, so that really, really put me into the this kind of historical context in regards to masonry. So, so that helped the MA flow really, you know. And um, um, and then after I finished the MA, this was about a year, I think. The uh, the guys at the university said, "Oh yeah, we love this. Um, do you want to do a PhD?" So I said, "Yeah." So and that started from there. So. I did the PhD. Same time, I got some teaching work, lecturing work, um, supervision work, you know, for mm -hmm. uh, uh, degree students and things like that, and uh, you know, the, for the exams and things, which was good. Yeah. Um, and that that carried on for about uh, it was part time, so it was about seven years. And and that became the first book. The PhD, once I successfully defended that, that became the first book. And so things went on from there, really. And uh, it, it's something that I never thought of doing. When, when I was at school, if someone would have asked, you know, what are you going to do when you, you know, as a career later on in life, you know, I wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to write Masonic books. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was a complete kind of curveball thing, really. Um, yeah. And uh, music was always my thing, you know. I always wanted to be involved in music. Um. And uh, but obviously your life takes you in a different way. Yeah, yeah. it definitely does. It does. Yeah. Unexpectedly. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's basically my background in that. And um, um, I left the the Cheshire Lodge because I moved to Liverpool. Oh okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and and just couldn't make the meetings because it was a Friday night. Right. And, and driving back from Liverpool was 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 a nightmare. So we ended up joining the Liverpool Lodge while I was in Liverpool. Um, and that, that, that was interesting because it was a completely different lodge. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I did, did the PhD, started the books. Um, I was also, um, there was a parallel career as a, as a, as a lecturer and a, and a, and a teacher. Um, so, uh, I worked in Liverpool for a while as well. Yeah. It was good because those kind of influences, filtered into the you know the first few books that, that I wrote you know so um, right Liverpool Masonic Rebellion yeah was another one um that that came about by, by accident again just um talking to someone at, at, at the festive board really and, they, and mm -hmm. uh, said oh did you know there was a Masonic Rebellion in Liverpool and I thought oh, that's, that sounds interesting right yeah and um he gave me his card and he says well well meet me um in the, in the Liverpool Masonic Hall certain day and I'll show you all these documents and it was great you oh know, wow loads of documents there great so that became a book um which has done really well great good and um yeah from there just other other books kind of came out of that you know? yeah the Dark Grand Lodge book came out of that because that that was a similar Masonic um story in a way yeah Independent yeah. Grand Lodge um yeah so just just went on from there you know mm. but all, all the books up until up to a certain point mm. um, probably the lost rights book up until the lost rights book were very english orientated yeah um and um by the time i got up to the lost rights book i, I was i was quite tired of writing about english freemason <laughs> right um you know you're a writer you, you, know, yeah. you know when when it's time to change direction yeah definitely yeah yeah. So, um, um, so the Lost Rights book came next after that. So great, great. Yeah. So getting to um, the Lost Rights and Rituals of Freemasonry, what 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 interested you in the subject, which is a uh, li little more focused in France and uh, I suppose in Germany as well? Yeah. Well, by by about 2016, I was I, I was getting a bit fed up of writing about English Freemasonry. Mm. I'd kind of gone full circle with it, really, and. Um, um, I had an interest, a growing interest in, in the esoteric side of, of, of Freemasonry by, by that time. Yeah. And it was a conversation 
that I had with a guy called Joe Wages. I don't know if you've... Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we just had this conversation about um, rights, these lost rights mm -hmm. uh, that, that were on the continent in um, the 18th century. Yeah. And it's something that, that I'd heard of and I'd, I'd been familiar with some of the rights, but not all of them and certainly not the history of them all. So I started to search for a book that, that would, you know, expand on this really. And right. I couldn't find a book, you know. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'll write a book. If, 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 if there's none there at the moment, I'll, 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 I'll do it myself. Right. So um, that's how that started really. Yeah. Um, um, and, and, and of course, when you, when you write something like that, it just becomes a, a collection of little histories, you know, and, and that's, that's not what I wanted, really. Mm. Um, but I, as I started re uh, reading uh, old books by um, John Yarker and, um, and Arthur Edward Waite, mm -hmm. um, it was clear that a lot of the occult revivalists in the, uh, the later 19th century were also inspired by, by some of these rites. Right, absolutely. And also tried to revive them. Yeah, so perhaps you could just go into that a little bit more. Why, why were they trying to revive them and, and what, what were they inspired by and what were they doing? Well, I think, I think they were looking for... Um, they, were, they were on the fringes of Freemasonry. They, yeah. you know, if you look at John Yarker, for example, he, he wanted more from, from craft masonry. Yeah. Um, so he, he, he basically left that behind and, and started venturing onto the fringes mm. um, with a, a group a collective of um, like-minded gentlemen, just like himself, you know, that, that, that were also doing this. And, yeah. and they started looking back at uh, characters like uh, Cagliostro mm -hmm. and um, um, uh, Baron von Hunt and, and people like these, you know, these, these charismatic figures of the 18th century on the continent that, that led these rites. Right. Um, <clears throat> and they they started kind of delving into these. Um, yeah, Swedenborg was was another um, figure that that they um, you know kind of examined. And, and even though right. Swedenborg wasn't a Mason, you know, he obviously inspired a lot of, of, of this. Uh, yeah. So so he um, was he was the Swedish mystic who claimed that angels visited him and interpreted the Bible to him chapter by chapter. Right. Yeah. yeah, and and there was a Swedenborgian right of Freemasonry for some time as well during the 19th century. That's right. Well, yeah. that, that was revived um, around the 1860s, 1870s. Yarker got hold of that, took it back to England and um, obviously gave it a bit of life over here. Yeah. And um, that became quite, quite successful. Um, and again, there's all this um, debate at the time whether it was a revive right um, mm -hmm. or, or whether it was just something that was made up and, and claimed to be a revive. Mm -hmm. Well, now now we know it was more of a made up thing, um, and that that that's the same for other other rights as well that um, a lot of Yarka's cohorts created at the time. You know, like uh, Fratre Lucis and and uh, uh, rights like that. You know. So they, they were getting inspired, you know, by, by these rites, creating them, you know, again, re, recreating them, if you like, mm. um, writing rituals for them, re, relaunching them amongst themselves and, and, and their followers. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you know, and, and, and it was all about this kind of search for the meaning within Freemasonry. Right. And a lot of these occultists were... We're basically looking to uh, commune with God, you know. To uh, right, uh, I suppose now we'll, you know, we call it um, the uh, the cosmic consciousness. You know, they they were, yeah. they were trying to um, that 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 was their end game. They were they were trying to get that really to attain that. Yeah, and um, that to me is the reason why they were searching on the fringes of Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, they were they were trying to get. These these mystical rites off the ground mm -hmm. and um, searching within these rites, you know, to find the answers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, obviously, um, you couldn't just join these groups uh, or these rites. Um, many of them were 
pretty secretive, I would imagine. Yeah. Oh yeah, the time. Yeah. And how many how many people in let's say in England do you think were involved in this world of, of fringe masonry? Um it's it's been estimated that it's probably a couple of hundred. Yeah. Which it's, is it's small. A few hundred, yeah. 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 Quite, quite small really. I think what what was happening there during during that particular phase was was that Freemasonry was very middle class. Right. Um I mean, it had to be because, you know, it was expensive. There was yeah. um, dining etiquette, for example. Um, yeah. You know, the, uh, the fees and, and um, um, just just mixing with, um, you know, certain people. If, if you look at the makeup of these lodges at that time, the later Victorian time in England, you know, it, it, they're, they're full of industrialists and local yeah. businessmen. And, um, you know, so... Um, it's obviously attracting a certain class of gentlemen, and right. some some of these gentlemen, like Yarker, like um, um, Major Irwin, F.G. Irwin, and, and um, Kenneth Mackenzie, and William Quilliam, you know, mm-hmm. who, who who was a solicitor. A, a lot of these people are middle class, you know. At the time, they've got money, they've got yep. spare money, uh, they've got spare time as well, which is. Um, which is what you need for these, and and these these people were travelling around, you know. Um, we've we've got the um, a good transport system going on at the time with the you know with the railways that were mm-hmm. all nicely linked up to various towns and cities, mm-hmm. um, so they could travel. Um, and you know they they'd all it'd be part of a social scene for 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 them as well, you know. So right. A nice kind of. Um, set of like-minded gentlemen that, that wanted to search for this yeah but they they were all on the same wavelength they were all examining different orders and and there were, there were quite a lot of orders you know that that, that was created at the time I mean, yeah the order of ishmael for example right uh the ancient order of zuzumites which yes um obviously you know we um uh we put together for the um the article yeah, for the fraternal review issue in, in the February. Yeah, period. yeah, that's right. So, um, and there was a Swedenborgian right, which we just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, the ancient and primitive right, which was uh, a variant on the Memphis Mizraim theme. Yeah. Um, there was um, the ancient order of Egypt. Um, you know, there was a celestial brotherhood. Right. Loads of of rights that they were involved with. Yeah. And what is so curious as well, it seems that uh, the individuals who were involved in, in, in these groups were, were often not just in one group, that they were in say, two or three, I think. Uh, I mean, Wes, William Wynne Westcott was in the Swedenborgian right and That's in the Societas Rosicruciana, of course, and in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And Qu- Quilliam was involved with the, uh, the, the Zuzimites, obviously, yeah. and the... Uh, the Swedenborgian right of Freemasonry, maybe among others. Uh, yeah. Why why are people joining you know, multiple rites if it's a, a search for God and these are legitimate uh, ways of finding it? What what is what's going on there? Do you think? Uh, I think that it was all about um, uh, creating these attractive exotic rites. Yeah, um, and obviously there writing the rituals you know yeah uh, if 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 you read the uh, the public texts like uh, you know kenneth mckenzie's uh, royal masonic psychopedia right. for example yeah. um, he mentions some of these rites in there mm. and he goes on about how ancient they are and oh yeah i met this guy in paris and 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 right. he and he gave me you know uh, this secret order you know yeah that's and, the order of ishmael right yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you know, and and he mentions other ones in there, uh, uh, the Sat Baha'i, for example, which yeah. uh, he he writes that came from this this uh, place in India and and was brought over by this, um, I think it was a Captain Archer, yeah, um, who who'd served in the army there and and came back to England, bringing this this mysterious ritual over here, yeah. But, uh, when when you read the uh, the personal letters, you know, between between these people these occultists they were they were in, in a society called the society of eight um and obviously there was eight of them and, and yeah. they were all writing to each other oh yeah i've got i've got a new ritual you know i've got oh, a really i've got a new order you know yeah and 
Kenneth McKenzie appears to be the main author of, of right. the, the majority of these rituals. Yeah. So he, he was he was fishing for these ideas. Mm. Um, uh, for example, being approached by this this Captain Archer mm. uh, and said, "Oh, I've, I've got this strange ritual order thing that came from India. Um, it needs a bit of work, you know. Maybe you're mm. the guy to do it." And um, so obviously Kenneth McKenzie was 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 put to work creating this this this, this ritual. Yeah, and he, he did the same for the for the Order of Ishmael, um, mm. possibly a few others as well. Um, some some that remain with us, some some that got lost over time. Mm. Uh, and um, so yeah, you know, the, and and it, and it seems to be something that they were swapping and exchanging amongst themselves. Right. Um, but at the same time, that they're, they're, they're also involved in uh, spiritualism, um, and uh, yeah. a lot of them have crystals. So, they, so they mention the use of crystals and oh, and really? The, like, like for example, Irwin. Yeah. Um, F. F. G. Irwin was um, supposedly in contact with uh, Cagliostro through his crystal. Oh, and, really? Like a crystal and, ball? That's right. Okay. That's right. And this is how. He supposedly got the the ritual for uh, Fratri Lucis. Ah, um, I see. From Cagliostro himself, mm. and a lot of people believe this. He, he, even Kenneth McKenzie, who is actually writing a paper on um, Cagliostro to see if he was really um, uh, Balsamo. Uh, yeah. The uh, famous Giuseppe Italian. Balsamo, yeah. Yeah, Giuseppe Balsamo, you know, the, which he, he probably was. Right. Uh, but Kenneth McKenzie wanted to nail this in a paper that I, th I think he wanted to present it to the uh, uh, the SRIA. Um, right. Which was very, you know, very early at the time, you know, it was in its early stages. Mm -hmm. um, and he actually wrote to Irwin and said, oh, I, I believe you're talking to Cagliastro through, through your crystal. You know, wow. Could you me if he was Balsamo. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so, so they even believed it, you know. Uh, there was a sense of belief in, 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 in what they were doing. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's so, incredible. Yeah, so, so here we get the link to, to the, um, you know, the, uh, the characters, the, the charismatic characters like Cagliastro and Pasquale, who's yeah. also mentioned a lot by, by uh, the likes of Yarka um, and Kenneth mm. McKenzie, you know, so, so, so there's a link here for this lost knowledge. They were, they were searching for lost knowledge, you know. Um, yeah. And, um, but also there was this more supernatural level to it all where, where it appears that they were also trying to, you know, commune with God and mm. to, um, to get answers, you know, for life. Right. The universe and beyond and and uh yeah so it's it was a fascinating time that that to me linked directly to this 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 past yeah uh, in in the 18th century and, right um, yeah interesting stuff yeah definitely yeah and so with them um, you know trying to speak to the deceased through a crystal ball and you mentioned uh, Pasquale, of course, who who was involved in some kind of uh, well, his his elect Cohen was definitely practicing some kind of occultism, and yeah. uh, Jean yeah. Baptiste uh, Willemot, uh, another another Masons yeah. were Im influenced by uh, mesmerism, a kind of hypnotism that was used for spirituality, and uh, you know for entering altered states of consciousness and everything. And this was the 18th century, of course, and um, you know. Yeah. Uh, entering into trance states, gazing into crystal balls. I mean, you wouldn't really find that in a Masonic lodge today. So, yeah. but, the, but there is this sort of weird tradition of this sort of occult phenomena in, in these, uh, some of these rites, right? So yeah. perhaps you could yeah. just talk a little bit about maybe the, <clears throat> the earlier rites, uh, Pasquale, uh, Willamot, and, uh, and, and how these things got going and what was their significance? Yeah, I mean the just just to go back up to the um, jump ahead a hundred years to the occult sure. revival again. The um, it's interesting you should say about uh, uh, mesmerism because Yarka um, was was writing papers on on mesmerism and, and um, oh, really? he, he he was tr uh, tr translating works from from the French, you know, um, which which is something that um, 
towards the end of his life when he when he hooked up with um, Alistair Crowley. Yeah. Craig Crowley was 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 interested in that 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 part of his work. Yeah. So, um, be, because it, it it so mirrored what the what these characters like Pasquale and and, and Cagliostro were doing. Right. In the uh, the 18th century. So. Yeah. Um, and of course Crowley um, thought he was the reincarnation of um, uh, of, of Cagliostro. So. Right. You know, it's it's all very interesting. It all fits together. Yeah, you know? absolutely. But, but yeah, in I mean, with Pasquale, for example, he he was he was doing similar things. You know, he was um, doing this work, uh, this this ritual work, supernatural uh, work that, that wasn't part of any lodge room working. Right. Was, yeah. was was for his followers to take home, and 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 practice. Yeah. Um, and this is where we get. Um, uh, Willemos, obviously trying to, um, you know, conjure up spirits and things and angels and stuff like this, but it it didn't work for him. So, right. so I think I think he he, he became a bit uh, disillusioned by it really, mm. and, and moved on. Uh, eventually, but uh, but with um, Louis Claude de Saint Martin, of course, I mean he he really embraced the the spiritual aspects and and that that comes out in his work. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's um, interesting the way that, that, that things unfold and, and get taken on different journeys. Yeah, definitely. And of course, Saint Martin, a, a disciple of Pasquale, his, his teachings, of course, were uh, put together in a sort of pseudo Masonic format. And, and there are still many Martinist uh, orders around today, um, mm. uh, teaching a kind of Christian esotericism, of course. But um, what, what are some of the more important rites of the 18th century? Um, well, there's, there's, there's so many, really. Um, mm. You have uh, the Rite of Zinnendorf, which is uh, uh, an interesting one. Uh, the African Builders, yeah, uh, which is another. Um, the um, Dracovich Observance, which is um, one that was based in... Croatia, but was based on the um, the right of strict observance. Um, again, it was a seven degree right. Um, the right of seven degrees, which is a really nice uh, right that uh, was practiced in London, mm. in England. Uh, that that was brought over by a Frenchman, um, Pierre Lambert de Linter, um, and he he was operating his his lodge under the um, the Grand Lodge of England, south of the River Trent, which which was one of these um, kind of uh, independent lodges that, that that existed for a while um, during the uh, uh, the seventeen seventies, seventeen eighties. So you know it, there was there was a lot going on there really, um, and it was the whole kind of uh, scene of Masonic experimentation, which which was interesting to me because these. The, yeah. These were guys that, that that weren't interested in in you know in, in the names that that they could be called like you know, you know these these days we have uh, the name or the term clandestine kind of banded around right it didn't bother these guys yeah these, the these guys were intent on um, carving up their their own masonic journey you know um, right and. That was their own personal journey that they were interested in, and and that's the way that they they, they wanted to go. And there were so many rights to sample. You know, if you fell out with one guy, yeah. you know, say, say you fell out with uh, Baron von Hunt, you know, you could move on to another one. You know. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. So um, there was there, there was so many to choose from. You know, um, Melisino's right, for example, which was a, a right. Again, it was seven degrees. It was roughly. Based around the uh, the right of strict observance, mm. uh, you know, with with Melisino's own own spin on it. Um, so yeah, you know, there was there was a lot going on there. There, there was a lot kind of um, of Masonic vision, really. Mm. Um, much Masonic vision by yeah. charismatic characters. Yeah, and in what in what ways uh, do these rites, such as the strict observance or the Egyptian rite, or um, Pasquale's Alec Cohen, in what ways do they differ from Freemasonry today, do you think? 
there was um, an offer of a pathway, really, mm. a progressive Masonic pathway that, that revealed uh, the Masonic story. Mm. Um, and um, it was mainly down to about seven degrees, you know, a nice, concise collection of degrees. Um, I, th- I think with Eloquan, it was it was nine degrees right. at one time. Um, but with the majority of the rights in France and, and, and uh, on the continent, it was um, put down to a nice seven, you know, collection of seven degrees. Obviously, mm. seven is a, you know, it's a mystical number. It's, right. it's a strong mas- uh, Masonic number, a magical yeah. number. So it's got a lot of meaning in there. And um, it ended normally with the, uh, the Rose Quartz. Really, that, right. that was the climax, yeah. Of, um, collection. What what you get with the right of seven degrees with um, uh, Delinto, Pierre Lambert Delinto. He he ended his right with Kadosh. Mm. So uh, there's a bit of a difference there, and um, this is where we get the evolution as well. Uh, so these 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 rights were operating as uh, separate entities. Right. Yeah. And, um, but but the, the, they were also evolving at yeah. the same time. So I think without a Grand Lodge system, um, it gave these uh, charismatic characters, individuals, uh, freedom to put together these rites and, mm. and to explore the Masonic story and to evolve as well. Yeah, Where yeah. When you've got a Grand Lodge system, um, it's encased in in its own um structure its own orderly structure right so yeah um, yeah there was there was a lot of freedom there mm. you know freedom to move about as well so you know if you fell out with one <laughs> rock, you know you could you could move to another you know yeah that's right uh, yeah and mix and match as well you know there was a lot of mixing and matching going yeah, yeah definitely yeah, and what is the what would you say is the lasting legacy of of the, these uh, rites today? Well, we still practice um, a lot of the degrees that that, that, that they practice, mm. um, but we we do it differently. You mm. know, uh, like for in, you know in in England, uh, for example, England and Wales. Um, you know, we have all these um, side orders. As they're called, you know, where where you can explore different side orders. You know, you can go in whatever direction you like. You know, you yeah. can go in a more esoteric direction and join the SRIA, or right, um, or you can um, continue that that traditional Masonic um, structure. You know, and and go down the Royal Arch and then mm-hmm. the March or um, the Knights Templar, and you know. It's all it's all very kind of structured and orderly and and um, mirrors, you know, the the template of craft Freemasonry really. You know, yeah. where, where, where you have a lodge meeting and you do a ritual and then you retire for a festive board and and you know that kind of thing. Yeah. Um. So you know you you have a choice. You know, which is good. I, I, I suppose it's you know it's, it's it's good to have those those choices. You know, and, and you can choose whichever side order you want to join. Mm. Um, so that that is part of the legacy, I would think. Mm. Um, the other legacy we have is is obviously going back to the occult revival, and, and the likes of John Yarker and Kenneth Mackenzie and Irwin and, mm-hmm. and um, William Quilliam and you know these these kind of characters. Right. They they, they also wanted that freedom. Yeah. Um, so hence they were creating these rights, and um, you know so part of of the legacy of the, the lost rights of the 18th century is 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 that element of freedom you know that um um people can can search out and explore really yeah yeah uh, absolutely yeah so it can go in different ways i think i, I think there's many levels to it um, yeah i always say that there's different levels in freemasonry it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's it's layered like an onion you know and um you have a more spiritual uh, element to it, and and obviously uh, what what Yaka referred to as the knife and fork mason. Right. Yes. That, that wanted to <laughs> escape from. Yeah. Right. So they were they were really trying to escape all the sort of formal dining. Well, they may have 
eaten together mm-hmm. or whatever but but that wasn't the focus for them right the focus for them was the mysteries symbols esotericism spirituality yeah that's right and 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 the freedom um you know to explore them you know yeah, yeah like yarka for example he he talks a lot about um in his works um he talks a lot about the escape his his escape from from that kind of uh knife and fork masonic culture mm. and um where, you know where people are um are lusting after um masonic aprons you know mm. uh, provincial honors and and grand lodge honors and you know that, yeah. that, that kind of thing you right know, escape from that yeah and um basically explore um what he believed was the true meaning of freemasonry as as he he mentions that freemasonry was a gateway for mm-hmm. him, you know yeah so it was a mere gateway that allowed him to progress to explore um, the more spiritual elements, right? So, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thing, you know, because that again is it, it, it reflects what was going on in the 18th century. Yeah, you know, with a lot of these charismatic figures, it was it was um, the freedom, you know, to uh, to explore different parts of the Masonic story. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. So one last question. So why why should we remember the lost rites and rituals? Um it's important as part of the evolution of Freemasonry. Yeah. Um obviously it's it's allowed us to have many of these um uh side orders that that, that we have today. Yeah. Uh, um going back to the right of seven degrees, for example, um I'm doing a bit of a detour here, but the when when that ended in the 1790s, um, a lot of these degrees that Delinto was practicing were cherry picked, mm. and they ended up being practiced in um, Knights Templar encampments, for example. Right. Yeah. Like, like those choir. So. Right. So a lot of these degrees were cherry picked and uh, kept alive in secret. Really, you know, they were, mm. you know, they they were they were practiced and. Um, awarded to various masons uh, that were involved in in various encampments and and um yeah. that way and then they they reemerge in an in an official light later on in the 19th century you know? right so um so yeah you know we we do have these um rights to thank for all these side degrees um mm. and um yeah i think i think the it's inspiring as well because the freedom mm-hmm. that they had to sample these these degrees and these uh, Masonic rites, you know, they 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 had this freedom to do that. Yeah, they were completely cut off from the um, from from the regular circuit and, and and not afraid of it as well, you know. Right. Um, right. But today, you know, we, we can we can see that if it wasn't for them, we probably wouldn't have these degrees. You know. Yeah. That we can experience today. So, yeah, you know, it's it's um, a strange one from from an, an outsider's point of view. It's um, it's all part of the uh, the Masonic um, development, really. Um, yeah, the evolution. But I think I think we're you know we um, we're obviously uh, for Masons today. You know, we're we're within this kind of Grand Lodge structure um that's that, that's firmly encased us now you mm-hmm. know within, within this masonic culture this this regular masonic culture so i don't yeah. think things like that could happen again right um, no absolutely mm. but saying that you know I'll, when when i did publish the book um um i got a lot of messages saying oh well you know some of these rights aren't exactly lost because oh really you know, did you know that the the right of strict observance has has just started going again in in France? You know. Oh really? Yeah, and and you know, <laughs> you know, so you know, you you get these kind of um, rights that that have been defunct for a long time and then suddenly just pop up. And but I think I think that's more to do with with the rituals being being published recently. That's right, definitely. Like and like yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, 
Where can mm. people get a hold of the Lost Rites and Rituals of Freemasonry? And where can people find out more about you and your work? Um, yeah, I mean, just go on Google, type my name in with Freemasonry. It'll all come up. Great. The Sonic website, of course, has, has, um, has got my books on there. So yes. I've got an online shop, so you can uh, buy the books direct from the Lewis Masonic website. LewisMasonic.co.uk <clears throat> And in the States, it's um, the use McCoy. Okay. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, 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 I've got a website, a uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, you can... Um, and I'm on Facebook, Twitter, so you can always give me a shout on there. And, Great. Uh, yeah, yeah, just just let me know. If you want any signed copies? Yeah. Great. I, don't believe, I, I believe I believe the the post is. Uh, I think it's just recovered now. The the um the post. So so people are getting the books a bit quicker now. <laughs> Good. Great. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, it's been great speaking with you and hearing all about the uh, lost rites and rituals of Freemasonry over the last couple of hundred years. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a been a pleasure to uh, uh, to be invited on and uh, have a chat. Yeah, oh, thank been, you. It's been good. Great, and hopefully Absolutely. we'll speak again. Yeah, definitely.